So, I'm looking at Wilde now as a playwright, and there's two really kind of famous images of of Oscar Wilde. And one is this sort of glittering wordsmith, this entertaining, witty um, conversationalist and raconteur, who entertained upper class circles. But at the same time, there is this view of this of the abject homosexual jeered at by passengers whilst he was waiting at Clapham Station in convict uniform. Then ended up with a two-year prison sentence in Reading Jail for homosexuality, which his famous ballad of Reading Jail was written in response to. But importantly, he understood the nature of masks that allow people to play out numerous identities, various versions of themselves, because he was both a victim and a product of social pressure in the late 19th century that imposed masks on late Victorian society. This partly comes from several, three strands in his identity that um, are responsible for this sense of duality. He's both a colonised Irishman and a member of, sort of British upper-class circles. So he hovered between both of those worlds. He was both a husband in a traditional household and the frequenter of male brothels with an aristocratic male lover. So he had both of those elements of sexual identity, but also a sophisticated and successful playwright for upper class audiences and a socialist who realized his audience deserved to be criticized. So he has this enormous sense of duality running through his national identity, his sexual identity, his political identity that I think pr propels his interest in duality and that we see in the, the, the identity creation and fabrication that goes on in the importance of being earnest. He is recognized for his exploitation of innovative techniques that are theatrical and linguistic. You know, his, his, his con the concept of wit is, is, he's one of the first names that springs to mind when we think of literary wit, the fast thinking, the, apt the, the aptitude with words to express um, carefully crafted thoughts and to respond to them in social scenarios with rapidity. But also the concept, so the concept of total theatre, where colour, design, the spatial relations of the actors, music and movement shape the themes of the play. The use of colour symbolism throughout his work is, is a central feature. And the lighting and shadow effect in his playwriting was again something innovative from a dramatic perspective. Also the presentation of a specific social group with, it, with its own ethical code of behaviour was something that really wild... Um, took on uh, as a real feature of his playwriting. The main features that appear in the importance of being earnest are this kind of farcical tone, this kind of um, deliberate exposure of the weaknesses and whims of a particular target group or target individual. The action in the end becomes increasingly kind of dance-like in performance. You know, there's this scripted almost um, intricately mechanized plot that brings the characters together to re-establish social order and harmony at the end and that the, the intricate cogs in that plot are part of a kind of dance-like almost choreography his stylization of mannerisms that characterize upper classes and the clergy etc so that they are in the end are reduced to kind of puppets he ridicules property and etiquette to expose, I think, the emptiness of the social codes of the upper classes in London of his day. And so there is a kind of a function of social criticism, I think, in, in this play, which is often at odds, actually, with some of the readings of him being, di being sort of distant from social concerns. And I think the intent is entirely satirical and farcical, and the setting is fashionable London in the late 19th century. And one of the central influences on Wilde's playwriting was the well-made play, which combined the flair for fast-moving and entertaining action with a new concern for more serious problems underlying the complacent facade of respectable society. And Ibsen was a, 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 an extremely notable influence on this particular form and on Wilde in general. Particularly, the mechanism of the past as a kind of ticking time bomb that will explode and drive the need for reassembling the social fabric. You see this in the play through the revelations about Jack's identity. It's generally organised to keep an audience interested and attentive. Some background information is given in Act 1 through a kind of question and answer format. 
And the action hurries from crisis to crisis, with coincidences playing vital parts in moving the plot forward. The suspense in these plays is usually generated by audience knowledge that a secret from the protagonist's past, usually given tangible form, would disrupt events in the present. And this makes a really interesting kind of counterpoint with Pinter's birthday party, which is also influenced by the well-made play, but he very deliberately extracts things from these conventions in order to produce that sort of abstract sense of fear and horror that he so expertly creates in the play. Wilde made kind of capital out of this this theatrical the set of theatrical conventions whilst actually mocking the conventions themselves. He gives us the woman with a past and the innocent Miss Prism. Jack's kind of guilty secret is made dramatically present by Algy, but also actually demands discovery. And the black handbag in the play is the key to the truth, which is revealed only at the last minute. So farce, importantly, involves improbable plot elements, but utilises little of the tradition of slapstick associated with the genre. So there is an element of farce in the improbability of some of the stories, but there isn't a great deal of kind of slapstick falling around like we've, we've come to associate with things like uh, the accidental death of an anarchist. There isn't elements of slapstick there. The burlesque is really mocking through absurdly distorted imitation of a well-known style but it's only insofar as it makes gentle fun of the situations and controversies of the well-made play so it is really only burlesque gently gently mocking of the well-made play dramatic conventions it does also have just g generic comedy conventions that are particularly well known but the device of separating siblings in infancy is a kind of famous plot controversy of a plot, plot controversy of comedy and it's throughout many of Shakespeare's comedies. The comic possibilities of a suitor wittily wooing his mistress under an assumed identity again runs throughout the history of, of English comedy. And the happy ending which resolves all mysteries and rewards each character according to their merits, that re-establishment of the social fabric is again another one of the stock conventions of theatrical comedy. In terms of wild style, Paradox and epigram are the central features of this. An epigram is this balanced statement encapsulating a clever or comic thought which reduces a moral system or a social attitude to a neatly turned phrase. So it's basically a, a very polished, neat definition of a big idea, a moral system or a social attitude. We see these in Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn here. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. Again, this is actually one of the, the epigrams that captures both the, the nature of the epigram, but also of its paradoxical structure and how it frequently is written in wild um, writing. But we'll just deal with the epigrammatic feature of this one first of all. With the, ignorance itself is a kind of precious commodity. It's like a, this delicate, exotic fruit, and that there is a bliss to be um, experienced through ignorance. And that if you touch the fruit itself, if you touch this fragile innocence, then the bloom, its sheen, its, it's sort of sheen of vitality and its, its um, refulgence is, is lost. Gwendolyn then says, in matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. So again, we've got this epigrammatic saying, this, this abstract rule, you know, it becomes like a maxim, a rule for life that in hugely important moments, style rather than honesty and sincerity is the vital thing, which of course fits in, you know, is an articulation of Wilde's aestheticism here. But the paradoxical components of this are important. It's a style of epigram. So, you know, a paradox is often a type of epigram. But an epigram doesn't have to be a paradox. In Wilde's writing anyway. And it builds an association within one statement of two apparently contradictory ideas in order to challenge conventions or to suggest new ones. And this is the key part of, I think, Wilde's version of the paradox is that they challenge social conventions or formulate new ones. And this is a particularly good example, I think, from Lady Bracknell in the play, that all women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does, and that's his. You know, we have this very, you know, conventional critical vision of um, female influence that we, that we can hear almost kind of bemoaning, bewailing, uh, long-suffering husband uttering these first two lines. But then Wilde paradoxically flips this on his head. No man becomes like his mother and that's his tragedy. And so we have the, 
in that in that reversal, in that contradictory element in the second half of the paradox, a new social convention being suggested that actually men ought to mimic and borrow from their mothers a lot more readily than they do, particularly in late Victorian society, you know, that of patri patriarchal and patrilinear influence being the kind of dominant mode of, of, of male identity formation. Here we have something uh, sort of as an alternative that men ought to mimic their mothers. His characters and his characterization is also an important feature of the play itself. There are two heroes in this play pursuing their own desires, which is a, an important feature of Wilde's comedy, and it, and it offers a, a great deal of, kind of comic potential. John, or Jack Worthing, as he actually is. Jack is the play's protagonist and his most sympathetic character. He's found in a handbag on a railway line and feels less at home in aristocratic society than does Algon. So he, he, I think, hovers between those two worlds of, of the upper classes and then everything that comes outside of them. Um, he lives in the country but has invented a wicked brother named Ernest who scrapes require Jack's attendance in the city. So he again invents the premise for a dual identity in order to be able to give himself the freedom that he obviously longs for. And he in the play is a foil for sort of Algie's frivolity. Algie is the is the great sort of pleasure seeker, the, the funster in the play, and, and Jack is the one with, with some form of moral gravity. And he's presented, I think, as a respectable member of society, ironically, because, of course, he's the one that doesn't actually come from directly in terms of blood inheritance, um, those privileged echelons of, of society. And it's, you know, in spite of his parental qualifications. Moncrief, Algi, is the foil to Jack, and he's a hedonist. He's created a friend named Bunbury, whose status as a permanent invalid allows Algernon to leave the city whenever he pleases. So he believes this activity, bunburying, is necessary, especially if one is going to get married, something that he vows never to do. So you have to have this freedom to express yourself, this freedom to reinvent your identity if you are going to, basically in his view, hamstring yourself, limit yourself through your adherence to social codes that, that fix the self and fix identity in a, in a network of social relations like marriage. He, in the end, embodies the conflict between conventional motives and idleness and fecklessness. So he has this, you know, this strong sense of sort of convention and class privilege, but at the same time is lazy and, and, and clumsy and, and sort of idiotic in his behaviour. So his lifestyle is actually the source of ridicule. But he does have a neat epigram for major conflicts and moments of paroxysm regarding his minor faults. So he has this, you know, this coolness and, and linguistic poise every time there's a, there's a major problem. But then has these sort of paroxysms of panic and, and outburst at minor faults in his life. Lady Bracknell is the antagonist in this play, blocking both of the potential mar marriages. She embodies really the, the extremely negative side of Victorian classes. She doesn't allow Gwendolyn to marry Jack, and she finds out she's an orphan, and she dislikes Cecily as a mate for her nephew, Algernon, until she learns that Cecily is wealthy. So she represents, I think, the worst in social class prejudice in the play. Gwendolyn is Lady Bracknell's daughter and is the object of Jack's attention. In the end, she returns to his love, but she does appear self-centred and flighty. And like Cecily, she desires nothing but to marry someone named Ernest. She's also acknowledged as being kind of beautiful and self-conscious, as being a rich prize. Cecily is Jack's ward. He's effectively adopted her and cared for her. And lives with him in the country. She's young and pretty, and Algernon is, takes a shine to her. She's favoured by him, who pretends to be Jack's brother Ernest. You know, he, he, at that time, pretends that he's someone else. Cecily's heard about this brother and has written correspondences between the two of them for months by the time she meets Algernon, who she believes is Ernest. And like Gwendolyn, she's only interested in marrying a man named Ernest. Her honesty and directness and spontaneity make her a kind of excellent foil for the, the inauthenticity and falsity of London society. She's a, she's a character who, with whom it's easy to kind of get on board. Miss Prism is Cecily's governess. She obviously loves Chasuble. Though not the fact that he, though the fact, sorry, that he's a priest 
prohibits her from telling him directly. Lane is Algernon's butler and derives a number of sorry to de delivers a number of very droll kind of witty lines, which show that he's far from this being this kind of passive observer. He has a great deal of wit as well. Chasuble is a rector, and frequently visits Jack's country house to see him's prison, even though he's celibate. He seems well matched for the sort of educated moralism in this prison. Merriman is Jack's butler, who has a less significant role than Lane, but in one scene he and another servant forced the bickering Gwendolyn and Cecily to maintain supposedly polite conversation, so he has an active intervention at that moment. 